Yeah, this is so lovely. Thank you. Really good to see all of you. Uh, so yes, happy Dhamma Day. So today on July 20th is Dhamma Day this year. Uh, so it's, um, you might hear it called Dharma Day or Dhamma Day. So Dhamma is just the Pali word for it uh, versus Dharma is the Sanskrit word. Uh, but in both cases, it has to do with the Buddha's teachings. And that's today, this year. Uh, it's also sometimes known as a Salha Puja in the Theravadan Buddhism tradition. And uh, this is one of the most important festivals in Theravada Buddhism. So if you're curious, I have some slides I'm going to show you. They're just pictures. I'm going to show these from time to time, just so you get a sense of some stuff. So if this is a map of Asia here. So these are the three main schools in Buddhism. There we go. So Theravadan Buddhism is kind of the original Buddhism, and it's the one in red. So you see it's down there in Sri Lanka and Burma and uh, parts of Bhutan, Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and parts of Vietnam. And so that's Theravada Buddhism. So uh, Dhamma Day is a huge festival in the Theravada tradition. And then Mahayana Buddhism uh, is kind of the rest of what's on the map. Uh, there's the East Asian Mahayana, which is in the yellow, uh, in China and Korea and Japan and Vietnam. And then uh, the Vajrayana or Tibetan Buddhism is in the orange around Tibet and up in Mongolia and even parts of Russia. So these are kind of the three main branches in Buddhism. And then if you hear about like Zen, that comes out of Japan. That's a Mahayana tradition. And uh, there are a few other branches, Pure Land Buddhism in China. But today we're talking about down here, Southeast Asia, uh, the Theravadan tradition. Here we go. So yes, so Dhamma Day is celebrated on the full moon of the eighth month of the lunar calendar. So it usually falls in July. And uh, there are um, three main uh, Upasatha days. So Upasatha is kind of a category of festivals in the Theravatan tradition. And uh, these include the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha day. So earlier, uh, when we were taking our refuges in the one song, I take my refuge in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. It's the Buddha is the idea of the one who is enlightened. So showing us that all of us can be enlightened. And then the Dhamma are the teachings that allow us to reach enlightenment. And then the Sangha is the community of believers. So these are three festival days. Uh, so Buddha Day is also known as Vesak, uh, which is usually around late May. Uh, the uh, Sangha Day is Maha Puja, which is in late February around that time. And then Dhamma Day. So this is the last one in the year, and uh, this is the one about the teachings. Just go to some of these. Uh, yes, so it's celebrated today, uh, and it's celebrating the Buddha's first teaching at the Deer Park in Sarnath. And I have a picture of where that is, just to give you a sense of this. So these are the four main sites in the Buddha's life. So Sarnath, you see, I, I think you can see if I kind of move around. So Sarnath is this one. So the first one is Lumbini, which is the one in Nepal, and that's where the Buddha was born. Um, Bodh Gaya is the one that's kind of the furthest east, and that's where Buddha reached enlightenment. Sarnath is the one we're talking about today, and that's the one that's actually just outside Varanasi. And that is where Buddha gave his first sermon, which is what we're honoring today. And then Kusinagara is where Buddha died. So all of these, you can do a pilgrimage uh, to Indian Paul and see all four of these. And I myself, uh, Samir and I have been to Bodh Gaya and Sarnath uh, to see. So in Sarnath, it's the Deer Park. And then I have a picture of that. Oh, hold on. I'm going to come back to these. So this is what Sarnath looks like today. Uh, so there is this huge stupa or this big building in Sarnath. And this is showing kind of the site of where Buddha gave this first sermon. And uh, there are lots of pictures there of what they imagine the first sermon looked like. And then monks go there and people from all over go there uh, to honor when Buddha gave the first teaching. Uh, yes, and so the Buddha reached enlightenment in Bodh Gaya. And before that, uh, you might remember he'd been traveling with a small group of uh, five ascetics. So people who had kind of separated themselves from society and who lives in a rather extreme way of trying to limit uh, any kind of pleasure and not interacting with a lot of aspects of life that other people might have, not settling down with a partner or having children or having a regular job to make money or a lot of riches. 
And so he'd been traveling with his five companions uh, for years. And then when he almost starved to death, he realized that this wasn't working. He needed a new path. And so he meditated. And after he reached enlightenment, he found his five former friends and they met up in this deer park. It said that um, his friends were already there in Sarnath. And so he came and he gave his first teaching to them. And basically he described what it was that he realized uh, while he was meditating in Bodh Gaya. Uh, and in doing this, he essentially laid down what the teaching is, like the kind of the essence of all of Buddhism, but the four noble truths, which I'm sure you've heard of. So the truth of suffering or the dukkha, which is that all of us experience suffering, all beings suffer, the cause of suffering. And that's because of the, um, the cause is the tanha, or the craving that we have. We want things to be different than they are. We're not happy with life as it is. We want things to be different. We crave having pleasure, having some kind of stability or permanence, wanting things to be different. And because of that, we feel suffering about life. But also in this, he found the cessation of suffering, which is the third noble truth, which is nirvana, that it's possible for us to let go of our craving and just to experience life as it is without trying to make it different than how it is. And we do this through the fourth noble truth, which is the noble eightfold path. So it's the truth of suffering, the cause of suffering, the cessation of suffering and of the path. Those are the four noble truths. And, uh, and then if you notice, there are a lot of numbers in Buddhism. I sometimes comment on this. So, so far, we're talking about, so we have the three refuges, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. And then the four noble truths, the truth of suffering, the cause of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and of the path. And the path has eight parts. And the reason there are so many numbers is because, of course, at this time, most people couldn't read and wouldn't write everything down. So if you number things in lists, it's a lot easier to remember them. So that's why I've seen little cartoons of like giving children like little picture books and helping them remember their numbers, Buddhist children, by all these things, because there's a lot of numbers going on. Uh, but the Noble Eightfold Path is if you try to follow these eight things that can help you no longer suffer. So it's having the right worldview. And by that, it's the idea that things are going to change. So the worldview that things are not all about us personally, but also things are going to change. There's no permanence having the right intentions and in how we live. So acting in a way, wanting the right intention to help all beings speaking in the right way. So as not to cause harm or suffering to ourselves or others acting in the right way. Again, trying to benefit people having the right livelihood. I said, it's very hard to reach enlightenment. If your job is for instance, working in a slaughterhouse, killing a lot of beings or lots of jobs, being a guns manufacturer, probably not helpful for reaching enlightenment, uh, putting in the right effort, uh, not being too lazy and uh, making sure that we actually want to contribute in some way, uh, practicing mindfulness. So we're actually present with what's going on around us and practicing meditative focus. And that's related to mindfulness. So actually being focused and being present and being fully there for those around us. So those are the noble, uh, the noble eightfold path. So this is what he laid out that day to his former companions. Uh, these are considered the heart of the Dharma and everything else that he taught after this is kind of extrapolating more on this. And uh, and actually this particular teaching is called the Dhamma Kaka Pavadana Sutra, uh, which is like when he lays out the four noble truths and then the eightfold path. And so actually on Dhamma day now, monks will chant this. So this is written down as the first teaching and uh, they'll, um, They'll chant this over the course of the day. And I can tell you a bit more about it in a little bit. Uh, but it said, so he gave this teaching in Sarnath uh, to his five companions. And at the end of the talk, uh, one of his former companions, uh, the venerable Kondana, who was the oldest among them, actually said um, he took in the teaching and uh, he recounted his understanding of that and then asked if he could follow the Buddha. And uh, it said that when uh, Kondana took in the teaching, he actually reached the first level of enlightenment just by listening to the discourse. And he reached that because as he heard this, he let go of the first three fetters that bind us to being reborn and experiencing suffering over and over. And uh, the things that he let go of just in hearing this for the first time are self-view, so being totally focused on oneself, 
uh, clinging to rites and rituals and wanting everything to be just so and not being okay with how things are and skeptical indecision. So he experienced it with openness. And uh, once by just hearing this and kind of going into it with an open mind, it said that he reached Sotapanna, which means he became a stream winner. And uh, and this is kind of, there are different levels of fully understanding the teachings. So, but if you sit and you hear this for the first time, he was open enough listening to his former companion that he kind of let go of some of this clinging he had before and his focus on himself. And he actually became the very first monk. And uh, shortly after that, uh, the other four decided to follow the Buddha as well. So all five of his former companions, rather than being mad that he left them and was now uh, practicing something slightly different, uh, they actually decided to follow him and they became his first Sangha. And the Sangha is the community. Uh, and it's also worth mentioning that, um, you know, the Buddha's mother died when he was an infant. And so he was raised by his maternal aunts. And the first time she heard the teaching, it said she also dropped into Sotapanna, became a stream winner, and she wanted to follow him as well. And at first, he didn't want to have women following him because he thought it was going to basically distract the monks. And he said, oh, if, you know, if I let there be nuns as well, it's going to set us back by ages, which as a woman, I find quite aggravating. But she ended up convincing him and she became the first nun. Uh, so I think it's very cool that the first people who heard his teaching saw such wisdom in it that they started following him. So right away, the Sangha was born. So Sarnath is actually the birthplace of the first Sangha. So even though we're celebrating Dhamma Day, which is celebrating his first teaching, it's linked right away to Sangha. Uh, because as soon as you have the teaching, you have the community that wants to follow the teaching. And I'll go back quickly to show you a couple more of these pictures. Uh, so again, this is in Sarnath. And then uh, here are a couple pictures of how they imagine this. So with the Buddha at the center, and these are his five companions who are listening to him along with the deer, because this was in a big deer park. It's kind of in the woods, and there were lots of deer in that area. And this is another kind of a Tonka painting or like a traditional painting of the same sort of thing. I do, there's a lot of art that goes into what each particular pose or each item means, and I'm not familiar with all of these here. Uh, but you can see the two of the five companions holding bowls of rice. And uh, so they're actually going to eat, which I think is significant because the reason that he stopped practicing with them before is he almost starved to death. And he was revived by Sujata, who was a young girl who brought him food, who brought him rice pudding. Uh, so the monks who are the, um, the ones who are with him, who were also probably on the verge of starvation are starting to eat as they listen to his teaching, which I think is really neat. Uh, and here's another, here's uh, a wall carving of it. And you see them all kind of looking up at him, listening, and the deer is in front of him. And then you also see a woman and a child there. So the teaching goes out for all beings. It's not just for monks, but it's also for all who listen to it. Uh, and this again is Sarnath. And then, yes, uh, so this is the Dharma wheel. And so the um, the name for the teaching he gave, the Dhamma Kaka Pavatana, uh, actually means setting the wheel of dharma in motion. And so you often see this. So the most traditional symbol for Buddhism is this wheel in the center. And it it has different numbers of spokes depending on who makes it, but it usually has eight spokes in the center for the eightfold path. And it's drawn to be like a chariot wheel. And so it's said that when he gave this first teaching, he set the wheel in motion for the for this time. And it's because if it's like a chariot, humanity is riding on the chariot, and he starts pushing all of us as humanity towards enlightenment. And it said later when uh, the Tibetan tradition started, it set the wheel in motion again. So it's like each new teaching we have or each new, each new awareness we have, it pushes the wheel further and further, hopefully to get us to enlightenment as a group. Uh, so this is a very common motif here with the wheel in the center and then the deer to it as a representation of this. And uh, and sometimes you'll see the wheel just with four spokes when it represents the four noble truths. And sometimes it has more spokes if it's including not just the eightfold path, but additional teachings, as you can see in this one. Uh, yes, so I mentioned that when uh, his friend, uh, Kondana, first heard the teaching and uh, let go of three fetters, uh, those three fetters would bind him to the three lowest realms. So in Buddhism, again, we have many, many numbers. 
Uh, so there are six different realms uh, and uh, that you can kind of be born into. And so the fetters were the ones that would make him be born into the lower ones. So the one in the bottom. So this is kind of a, a Tonka painting, another traditional painting that shows six of the realms. So the one in the bottom uh, is the hell realm. And people who experience a lot of anger, uh, well, it's said that if you're struggling with anger and hatred throughout your life, then when you die, you would be reborn into the hell realm where you experience a lot of suffering because of this. And not that you're there permanently. It doesn't work the same way as in uh, Judeo-Christianity, uh, but that in your next life, you'll be struggling as though you're living in hell because you have so much anger and hatred in you trying to let go of that. So that's one of the fetters that um, Pandana got to let go of just by hearing the Buddhist teaching. And then the one here that's uh, on the bottom left-hand side, that's the hungry ghost realm. And they're usually portrayed as beings with very small mouths and very big stomachs. So they're hungry all the time, but they can't be sated. And that's if we have a lot of clinging. Uh, sometimes I joke, like I'll eat a dessert that's really good. And I'm like, oh no, now I'm in the hungry ghost realm because the rest of my life, I'm going to want like a cheesecake that's as good as that cheesecake. Or, you know, if you kind of, you can't be satiated, uh, you have this like ongoing clinging. You, you get a job with a lot of money, but you want even more money. Or you buy a house, but you want a bigger house. Like, like honestly, our whole capitalist society works on the hungry ghost realm. The idea that we're never satisfied. and uh, But by letting go of our clinging, uh, that was the second fetter. Then he won't be reborn into that. And then the one on the bottom here on the right shows a bunch of animals. And it's really beautiful. It's really a uh, beautiful scene. But the uh, And I love animals. And it's wonderful. But the problem with the animal realm uh, in Buddhism is if you have a lot of fear, so you're too afraid that you um you can't really assert yourself or your values of what you think needs to happen. So it, you can get reborn as an animal that's kind of very skittish, like you can't really um, put forward your own autonomy or anything that you want because you're scared of everything around you. So it's like you operate really instinctually, and but by letting go of his skeptical indecision and his fear, then he won't be reborn in that way. And another time I can tell you more about the realms in the top um, that I thought was kind of interesting that just hearing the teaching uh, and taking it in an open hearted way can help you let go of hatred, fear, and incessant clinging. Uh, here's a picture of monks celebrating on Dhamma Day by lighting candles. Candles often have to do with our focus in meditation. You can light a candle so you can focus, but also the idea of like the truth can have the truth, uh, fire as truth. So the monks um, meditating there along the river. This is in Cambodia. And here's another one uh, also of just getting together to meditate. And that's the other thing that's very significant. I think that's my last picture. Uh, that's significant about this day as Dhamma Day is this comes right before um, a period of time called as Vasa, uh, which is also sometimes it's called like Buddhist Lent. And so remember, in this part of the world, there's the monsoon season in the midsummer all the way through the fall. And so before uh, this uh, retreat period was set up, it was common for the monks to be traveling around together as groups. But then during the monsoon season, it wasn't safe to be traveling a lot. You needed to kind of stay somewhere where you could be out of the weather. And so there's a three-month period that starts tomorrow uh, called Vasa, or the Rains Retreat. Uh, in Theravada Buddhism, uh, or again, Buddhist Lent, uh, where the monks uh, practice a three-month period, more intensive practice. Uh, and then Buddhist lay people in this area, the reason it's thought of in a Lenten way is it's common for lay people to say, okay, I want to recommit to my practice. I'm going to stop drinking alcohol for these three months. I'm going to stop eating meat. I'm going to stop smoking. These kind of things I really want to focus during this time. Uh, so Dhamma Day, uh, today, we celebrate the Dharma and the teachings that can help us be free from suffering. And then starting tomorrow, we kind of focus back in in a more intensive way in our practice for a few months. Um, so yeah, so it makes sense with the calendar. And then finally, for lay people, so this is how monks celebrate now, but for lay people also, Dhamma Day is really important for gratitude uh, because we have so much gratitude for the teachings to the Buddha and the community that has kept the teachings alive all this time. Uh, but also um, just for the teachings and any teachings that help free us from suffering. So in closing, I want to share, this is a meditation 
uh, from Jack Cornfield, uh, the Western Buddhist teacher. Oh, oh, I quickly, I want to say something, which is that Buddha held um, gratitude in such high regard that he actually, he has these two quotes uh, in the Anguttara Nikaya, uh, two of his teachings, which are, it's a little sad, uh, but in the first one, he says, the appearance of three persons are rare in the world. Which three? The first is the appearance of a Buddha, like an awakened being. The second is the appearance of a person who can teach the Dharma. And the third is the appearance of a person who's grateful. And that it's so rare to find people who are grateful. And he says later in the same Nikaya or in the same teaching, there are two persons who are rare to find in the world. Which two? First, the one who volunteers to help others selflessly. And second, the one who is grateful and thankful for kindnesses that are done. And so just even in focusing on our own gratitude during this time, which is one way that lay folks uh, can celebrate Dhamma Day, um, that can help us kind of bring more kindness into the world and remind others of how thankful we are for them. So yes, yeah, so let's just end. This will just be a very short, maybe three minute meditation that we'll do together. This is from Jack Cornfield. So let's just relax our bodies if we can. Feel free to close your eyes if you feel so calm. Just take a few breaths. And we want to begin our practice of gratitude by feeling how year after year we've cared for our bodies and our lives. So send ourselves gratitude for all we've done to take care of ourselves and to get us where we are here today. And then let us begin to acknowledge all who've supported us in our care. So with gratitude, we remember the people, animals, plants, insects, creatures of the sky and sea, air and water, fire and earth, all whose joyful exertion bless my life every day. With gratitude, we remember the care and labor of a thousand generations of elders and ancestors who came before us. We offer our gratitude for the blessing of the earth around us. We offer gratitude for whatever measure of health we've been given. We offer gratitude for all our loved ones. We offer gratitude for our community, whatever community looks like for you. We offer gratitude for the teachings and the lessons we've been given. And finally, we offer gratitude for the lives we've been given. Now you can take a few more breaths.
And when you're ready, open your eyes. Thank you.